What are your goals? A colleague of mine shared with me a talk about how every year he writes down 100 things that he wants to do with his life, and the next year he writes down another 100, and the next year he writes down another 100. He sets aside some time to do this activity, and so I thought, you know what, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that activity. So a few weeks ago on a road trip with my eldest son, I had him write them all down for me. I got to 40, and it's, I was driving, and it's a lot easier for me to dictate them to somebody else. And there was a lot, a lot of long pauses. I got to uh, 40, and then I started slowing down, and then I got to 50, and I stopped. And so next year, I'm planning on doing this again. I don't know if I'll do it on a road trip to, uh, to California, but I, I may do it on a road trip to Winter Family Weekend and compare what I wrote down then, or what my son wrote down for me, to what I wrote down in the future. And look back at my goals and see where I'm at on my journey and see if I have changed paths, see if some things have dropped off of my list. Maybe some new things have added on to my list. Well, please turn to 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. There is a quote by a gentleman by the name of Thomas Watson. He once said, Nothing so conclusively proves a man's ability to lead others as what he does from day to day to lead himself. Now, there's no reason why you should know who Watson is, unless it makes you think back to 2011 when the Watson computer beat the world champion of Jeopardy in a computer versus human standoff or competition in which Watson failed, and I don't know if Watson won, but I think Watson eventually won. But Watson, the computer, was named after this gentleman. He was a CEO of, and president of IBM. And so he knows a little bit about leadership. So in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Bible. Verse 7, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, or of cowardice, or of craven and cringing and fawning, but he, but he, God, gave us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and a well-balanced mind and disciplined, well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. So leading ourselves, leading ourselves to our goals is filled with many choices. Those choices set direction in our lives. And those qualities that we develop are not something we do that is one and done. Those qualities are what we do and what we use as we move towards our goals. So let's start with the end in mind. The end can be found in the Bible. The end of our journey, the end of our goal, the goals we set for ourselves can be found in the Bible and is, and is summarized handily in the fourth fundamental belief of the Church of God. So if you haven't Googled it already, the fourth fundamental belief of God, I'll just point you to the cogwa.com or it redirects to cogwa.org if you haven't. Um, and it's a website under about. And as I'm reading this, if you want to look at the other 20 fundamental beliefs, go for it. But it states the purpose of human life. God's purpose for human beings is to add them as children to his eternal family. I'm reading from the fundamental beliefs. While it is clear that eternal life is a gift from God, he expects his children to respond to his calling, develop righteous character by overcoming sin, and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. When Christ returns to this earth, these faithful humans will be born as spirit beings into the family of God and will reign on earth as kings and priests with Christ. Well, the theme for youth camps this year sums up these points about discipline, about leading, about setting goals, about the plan for mankind very well. If you haven't heard yet, <laughs> we've been hearing about it a lot, is that the theme for camp is mapping your future. And each one of those words, mapping your future, fits well with what I want to talk about today, starting with mapping. So my grandfather 
had a lot of maps. He had a subscription to National Geographic magazine. He had a deluxe map membership, which I was the uh, bequeathed to me through my mother's side of the family. He must have had a deluxe membership. I know he had a ton of National Geographic. And there are a ton in here, hundreds. A lot bigger than the Bible. I'll get to that in a second. Well, one of the maps he gave me, or after he passed away, I took, mounted on my wall. It's a pretty big map. It provides some context of our world, how we fit in it. So if you recognize the United States, I don't think they make this map anymore. This was made back in 1965. They cut the world in half over here where you know we don't really pay much attention to in the old days in 1965 because we cared about the two oceans that separated the United States from the rest of the world. Now, I can use this to know that I have to go through the Isthmus of Panama to get to the bottom of South America. I want to run a marathon down here in Antarctica so I know where Antarctica, Antarctica is. But it's not very helpful for kind of getting around town. There's another map I had. Now this was, this was neat because it, it made me think of some other things. The map of the Northern Hemisphere. If you notice, there's a lot of land on the Northern Hemisphere. I Googled it because I saw this map. I was like, you know what? I wonder how much land is in the Northern Hemisphere. I wonder how many people live up here. Well, 87, no, 67% of the land in the whole world is in the Northern Hemisphere. So almost 70%. And 90% uh, of the human population is in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you don't like large groups of people, I don't know why you're in Houston, you might want to move to Australia. Australia, I hear it's really, really nice down there. And um, they don't, they, there's a lot of utilization opportunities in Australia. The second to third map that I have for you today is a couple of islands. It's got some pictures of some old guys and a couple of gals around the edge of it. And um, there's these two, you know, I don't know, godly beings like angels blowing down. I guess it's windy up here. You'll see on other ancient maps, they'll like have a, a, a dragon or, or a sea monster over here. It's like, don't go over there because you might get eaten by the sea, the sea monsters, right? If you believe the map, right? So don't, don't, don't leave. Well, there were a few people that left. And despite the mythology, they I think they were pilgrims, left and founded the United States, despite what they saw on those old maps. This is a practical map of London. Now I can see my way around here if I want to go sightseeing. I know what road I'm on. I can find myself on the map. This is pretty useful, right? I can go from Kensington Garden to St. James Park, and then maybe over here to um, the, the Tower Bridge, right? A useful map but it doesn't tell me where to go run my marathon in South, in Antarctica, going through South America. So maps are important. Well, the map we have as Christians, obvious where I'm going with this, it's a map for our lives. It reaches from the highest levels, God eternal, his plan for mankind, all the way down to our day-to-day -day living. If you're having issues with somebody, God tells you how to deal with that. Take a couple witnesses, two or three. Or it tells you, don't eat those animals, those unclean animals I put on the, on the ark. It says, rest on Saturday. So God's word permeates our whole life, our relationships, in our sustenance, and our worshipfulness, if worshipfulness is even a word. That leads me to my next point, is that we should be a servant leader, just as Watson alluded to. You can lead themselves, start with yourself, and then you may be able to lead others. And one of the biggest problems with leadership is pride. Pride was Satan's problem. He was a perfect angel. He was perfect until iniquity and pride was found in him. In Proverbs 16, verse 18, you don't have to turn there. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And so the opposite of pride, as we know, is humility. So Proverbs 11, verse 2, I have it circled. I don't know if I got that right, but Proverbs 11, verse 2, I'll just turn there. 
Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes a shame, but with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 11, verse 12. He is devoid of wisdom, despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. Many times we put the word servant in front of leader because that is the example that Christ set for us according to Matthew. Matthew 20, 25, verse 28. Just to set the context of this, you don't got to turn there, but in Matthew 25, verse 28, the two sons of Zebedee were, um, uh, their mother wanted the two sons of Zebedee to sit on the right hand and the left hand of Christ. And I mean, I guess it's not, that's not a good way to win friends and influence people by saying this in front of the rest of the apostles who are all Christ's followers. But Jesus called them to himself after she asked them to be on the right hand and left side. Verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whosoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, like the contrast between verse 26 and verse 27, he could have just said verse 26 and move on, but he led in, into verse 27. Be great among you as a group, let him be your servant. So there's some leeway there. You may be serve this person, serve a group of people. But in verse 27, if you want to be first, if you want to be number one, there's something you should, you should consider. Let him be your slave. This is the definition, or this is what is guiding Christ to help the disciples understand to be a servant leader. Our treasure is not here on earth. Our treasure is in heaven. But we still have goals. We still take this proverbial, those proverbial talents that we're given and double them and double them again and do it with the time that we have left here on earth. Now, 83% of business people agree, whoever business people are, 83% of them agree that leadership development is important at every level of their organization. But only 5% of those businesses have implemented leadership development at all levels. And Christ developed leaders all the way through his discipleship, from the fisherman to the tax collector to a Pharisee to a soldier in the army. Because leadership doesn't start with some corporate training session. Leadership starts with each one of us leading ourselves using God's map for us, which is the Word of God. Here, the Holy Bible. When we consider our thoughts, our behaviors and actions, and our words, we can be more effective leaders of ourselves, be servant leaders to others, and create a positive map for our future as kings and priests in the coming kingdom of God. What are your goals?